And therefore, since they are in fact controlled by Hamas, providing aid to those groups, even though we didn't put them on a list, we didn't provide any notice that providing aid to those, to those groups was wrong, providing aid to those groups is effectively providing aid to Hamas. And you can go to jail um, for a very, very long time. The first trial uh, ended in uh, acquittals uh, for uh, one of the individuals on most of the charges and hung a hung jury on all uh, of the other counts. They were retried and on the retrial uh, were convicted. Uh, but, so, but this is a case in which the government, uh, the government's own allegations identify not a penny that went to Hamas and the government concedes that every penny that was given to these charity committees was spent on legitimate, nonviolent, charitable activities. But notwithstanding the fact that it was all spent on lawful activities, and notwithstanding the fact uh, that the groups that were the recipient, direct recipients were not designated, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, the defendants were convicted, and the government is now defending that uh, on appeal. So that's a very troubling notion, because it's not only that you, know, you have to check these lists that change every week, but even if you check the lists, and make sure you're not providing aid to anybody on a list, if the government comes along after the fact and says, well, actually, you know, we never put this group on a list, but it was associated with or affiliated with this other group that's on the list, and therefore, even if you didn't know it, um, we, can, uh, we can hold you uh, uh, criminally uh, responsible. The government has made similar arguments, similar arguments in the context of freezing assets of charities. I represent a charity called Kind Hearts, which has had its assets frozen pending investigation uh, without any charges of, of uh, findings of wrongdoing now for over five years. Um, and, and again, there's no allegation that, the, that Kind Hearts ever supported a designated group, but they had transactions with a group that was subsequent to their having transactions with the group designated. So they never had transactions once the group was designated, but, but because they had uh, uh, transactions when it was not designated and when after checking the list it was an appropriate uh, group, um, they, uh, the government says their, their assets can be frozen. So there are real sort of uh, constitutional notice problems when the government says uh, not only can we make you uh, a, a criminal for providing humanitarian aid to needy children, but we can do that even where the recipient of the aid is not on any list that tells you that this is a group that you shouldn't be uh, engaged in. I just want to ask you, if you focus on this, mm -hmm. take it to the next, mm -hmm. to, from your perspective here. Uh, you talked a bit already about some of Karama's plans being uh, thwarted or you were you know, afraid to act on them because you couldn't get the reassurance. But could you talk also a little bit about um, the Zakat obligation and your familiarity with the chilling effect that some of these um, Decisions have had. Exactly what I'd like to comment is a good follow up to what David has said. First of all, let me explain for those of you who are not familiar with what Zakat is about. Uh, Islam as a religion has basically uh, uh, pillars of Islam, five, and one of them, a very important pillar, is to tithe, something that we understand. <laughs> we call it Zakat. So you cannot be a good Muslim keeping all your money to yourself. And it's very important that you help those that are closest to you and then further and further away. So like if it is your family or somebody you know or your community, it's important that you do the cat for them so that they don't become a public responsibility, so that they don't become poor and burden on the, on the government, etc. It's your responsibility. It's something like the, what is it called, the million points of light that we've heard about before. <laughs> that is really part and parcel of being a good Muslim. So a lot of Muslims were donating big money because Muslims in this country have good jobs and they make uh, uh, good incomes. So they were donating good money to the Holy Land Fund, to Kind Hearts, etc. And what happened when these charges were brought and the funds were frozen is that the zakat money got frozen and it's still stuck. And you know, like why? All right. If the government thought that this money might be going to the wrong place, the Muslim community was willing to say, take this money and let's give it to entities who need it, like even within the United States, doesn't have to go outside, who are Muslim and they need the tithing. No, it's still frozen. 
So Muslims start to think, you know, I don't know where my money is going to go the next time I give to another organization. What if it gets frozen? All this money is getting lost. It's not reaching the Muslim community. That's one issue. The other issue is, if I'm giving zakat to someone, and then the government comes back and says, you didn't know it, but they are controlled by, you know, what kind of due diligence am I going to do to satisfy myself that I'm okay? that I will not be uh, prosecuted severely for being a good person, for trying to help others. About the only thing open to me, I think, is that I give my money to the Red Cross and the Red Cross gives it to whichever Muslim country they want to give it to. Is that right? Is that, you know, is that what I have to do to be able to exercise my uh, uh, freedom of religion. So, as a result, a lot of people have been afraid to even tithe or engage in zakat. Some of them have reduced the amount of zakat drastically uh, to tailor it to those around them that they can give them money. But Muslims have, as a result of this, experienced two things. Well, the fragmentation of their community, uh, inability to uh, give zakat, and therefore not being good Muslims, therefore not being able to exercise their religion fully, therefore they are being discriminated against on the basis of their religion uh, in this country, uh, in the name of security, when the laws of security are not tailored at all, uh, narrowly to uh, protect the security of the country without impacting their rights. And I think we've heard enough about that here. So where do we go from here? Uh, besides observing further, that all of this together had put them in a bubble of fear. So that they do not feel that they are free citizens and can also associate freely and engage in free speech. Okay, um, you spoke a lot about uh, different uh, possibilities for reform and different avenues. Another area where I know that uh, you've been involved is trying to deal with some of the international community directly. And you and I were both at a program last week where we heard from one of the speakers was an ambassador from Switzerland, uh, which has taken a very different approach and, from the, our government, and said, well, we actually try and reach out and bring some of these groups together and work directly with them and facilitate the peaceful tactics that our Supreme Court doesn't seem to like. And they were a little bit concerned about whether this would cause fallout when their diplomats then tried to enter this country. But I'm wondering whether you see much of a hopeful sign that some of the international community may be helpful in bringing about some of the reform and be another possible avenue. There, there has been a high interest in the international community uh, for several years around this, the U.S. impact on these issues because the U.S. has uh, sent its staff abroad to actively uh, lobby for and push U.S. style regulations in other countries. and. and that's not always been well received, and groups, uh, particularly in the EU, uh, have fought back uh, fairly successfully to date uh, on a, a code of conduct that really was um, counterproductive. They don't have, the, well, for the most part, the same kind of material support prohibitions we have. Um, and in the UK, they have a regulatory model that uh, helps organizations correct problems uh, and protect charitable funds for charitable purposes, which is the opposite of what we have here. Um, so they've been very interested in, in helping promote reform in the U.S. because uh, the U.S. also lobbies uh, international regional bodies like the Financial Action Task Force to take um, measures on, that are more consistent with our, with our regime. Um, there, since the Humanitarian Law Project decision, there's also a um, greater interest in helping, helping us here in the U.S. with peace building groups like Geneva Call or Conciliation Resources that are not U.S. organizations, they're not based here, they may or may not <coughs> even have U.S. staff, but the material support statute has an extraterritorial jurisdiction provision that means uh, 
if you're a U.S. citizen uh, living abroad and you work for one of these organizations and you meet with uh, Hamas or uh, some other designated group to try to foster uh, peace um, discussions, you could be prosecuted. Um, or even if we, we had a visit two weeks ago from a delegation from the Swiss Federal Department um, that is looking at the impact on Islamic charities in particular. And uh, one of the gentlemen there works in conflict mediation, and he said when he landed at Dulles, he wondered if he might not get arrested uh, because he meets with groups that are on the U.S. list and trying to get them to uh, engage in peace negotiations. So it is having an international impact, uh, and there, there is a fair amount of interest. There's not, uh, it's not organized under any one banner right now, um, but that there seems to be growing interest in doing that. There's also a um, similar problem in Canada, and there are some groups there that are also organizing and wanting to coordinate with U.S. groups to look at changing these rules. One of the best forums for pushing this is uh, maybe at the UN, which has uh, put human rights front and center of its global counterterrorism strategy has made reforms in its own delisting process and it has uh, more humanitarian exemptions uh, in different sanctions programs so that um, there's some models there that may be helpful for the U.S. to get behind. So, also want to question for all of you. All of you have made reference to uh, people like former President Carter, former Attorney General Luke Casey, or the International Committee for the Red Cross where what they're doing could fit within this um, definition of material support that our government says could be prosecuted, but we don't expect them to prosecute those uh, individuals or entities, whereas others are not so fortunate to have that kind of um, confidence that they'll be okay. Uh, my question is, you can take it from either perspective. One, have you in your litigation or advocacy had anyone attempt to define for you what the line is where you will be okay? Why, why just because of President Carter? Um, or from the flip side of this, what advice would you give to someone who's not President Carter, who wants to make sure that they can engage uh, in humanitarian aid and not run afoul of the law? So they can just go down and each of you address that from whatever angle you see fit. I think if you're not a former president, a former attorney general, or the New York Times, you should be concerned. I, you know, I, I think I think actually that you know many groups, not just the New York Times and President Carter, many groups uh, sort of were operating on a kind of "don't ask, don't tell, don't pay too much attention" approach to this law prior to it getting a lot of attention in the um, humanitarian law project. But once it gets that attention, you know, if your general counsel for, say, Save the Children, um, you know, you can't really say, as a lawyer, you can't really say to your boss, you know, what we're doing is a federal crime, a terrorist crime, <laughs> subject to penalties of 15 years or more, but they won't prosecute us, <laughs> so go ahead and do it. I mean, you just, you know, a general counsel, a responsible general counsel can't say that. So the chilling effect of this is, um, is, is, is very extensive, and unfortunately, because of Holder, it's even more extensive because more people know about it. So that's what I would say. I mean, in fact, if you look at who has been prosecuted, it'd be, it'd be hard pressed to identify a single non-Muslim who's been prosecuted under the law. So if you're not Muslim, maybe you're safe uh, for the moment. Uh, uh, but but can you know can can a responsible general counsel actually rely on that? I, I don't think so. Well, you know I've had conversations as I mentioned in my uh, talk earlier, and there's one thing I'd like to mention. Once we had a meeting, several Muslim organizations and others with then Attorney General Gonzalez, and I mentioned to him in the public meeting that Karama could not donate to certain Muslim countries because of the laws and I explained to him some of what I said today. And he said, that can't be right. I don't believe it. I said, but it is true. He said, well, let's meet on it. Never mind. Um, 
I've also met with uh, officials from the current administration who actually promised me personally that they will do something. Okay, I'm an optimist. I'm going to keep hoping. Time, you know, there's time. We, we will work on it. <laughs> but if a Muslim comes to me and says, oh, I, I have a lot of money and I really want to donate to, well, let's say, how about the some of the Egyptians that were hurt in their democracy struggle, you know, we, we are trying to help them. I say, why don't you keep your money in your pocket? That is really not good advice, I can give them where they could be sent. Except to give it to the Red Cross, who I know will not be prosecuted. That is not right. Okay. Um, what I'm hearing is uh, along the lines of don't ask, don't tell uh, as well, where groups will uh, have a conversation with someone in government who will make a comment, yes, that's probably okay, and they don't ask for the letter, uh, they just go ahead and do it, or if they get an answer they don't like, they call someone else until, in the agency until they get the answer they do like. Um, and what that says to me is this law is unworkable. Uh, after, for example, after the uh, floods of the earthquake in Pakistan, um, the first organizations on the spot who had access to ambulances were on the terrorist list. Well, you're not going to not put someone on an ambulance when their life is threatened um, because it, you might later be prosecuted. So there's and there's also stories of the embassy in Sri Lanka kind of turning a blind eye to what was going on um, after the tsunami hit there um, with relief agencies going into areas that the Tamil Tigers were controlling. So that, that's what we're ending up with. Now there is a licensing procedure, a kind of should be an escape valve in the law that uh, the Treasury Office of Foreign Assets Control can uh, issue licenses that would allow uh, some of this aid to go through. The problem is uh, that um, there are no clear standards, certainly no uh, humanitarian standards that make sense to humanitarian operations, and there's no timeline or deadline for these licenses to be issued. So you can have a natural disaster, and I've heard groups saying they've waited nine, ten months to get a license to be able to get foodstuffs into an area, and it's, it's just not a workable system. Could I say one word? Uh, what really bothers me about this is that we are laying long-term foundations for selective prosecution in the future that would criminalize normal, average individuals in the Muslim community, which is consistent with the image of you know bad Islam that we hear about in the media. So you know, they're violent, they're this, they're that, and so if there are so many criminals amongst them, that makes sense. And when the average American hears that an American Muslim has been uh, jailed for supporting terrorism, they're not going to go read the case. They're just going to say, oh, so these people in large numbers are supporting terrorism. What's going to be happening in that community? Uh, before I open this up to Q&A with the audience, which we can do in a minute, I have one more question I want to ask for the whole panel, uh, which is turning toward the reform effort um, David said we had some bad cases in the uh, context of Carthyism before we got the, the relief but through the courts. Um, your predictions for whether we're le most likely to ultimately see this, well, it's a case that's unworkable, see reform through Congress or through the courts, and how long will it take? <laughs> <laughs> Someone else can go first. I think you have to take the long view, given who's in Congress right now. I, you know, I, I think I do think, though, that as Kay suggested, a fair amount can be done um, by the administration, uh, and I think there are some people within the administration who are um, sympathetic to the notion that this law is uh, written too broadly and that the processes that it provides are too summary. Um, uh, so I do think there's some possibility for uh, some ameliorative steps being taken in the administration, but. You know, only if there's a real uh, concerted showing by a broad cross-section of, uh, of mainstream institutions expressing concern about it. And that's, you know, that's what Kay's group is really trying to do, is to, is to pull together a, a coalition that will be paid attention to. Um, so I, I think there's 
there's certainly some possibilities there. I, I, Congress, I think, is, you know, who knows with this Congress. I, I hesitate to predict anything with respect to this Congress. But I wouldn't write them off if you, again, had a very broad range of uh, mainstream groups uh, uh, expressing concern about the bro broad scope of this law and uh, advocating carve-outs for the kinds of activities that I think most people on both sides of the aisle would see as, um, as legitimate and, and the kind of activity that we actually want to promote. I think that's a very good point, uh, that the Muslim community and its supporters need to make it clear that what's happening to us strikes at the soul of what this country is about at the heart of the Constitution, and therefore it's not, a, it's not a Muslim problem, it's an American problem. And that's why it is a problem for a wide coalition, for decent Americans, to do something about it. Now, yeah, uh, we can do something with the administration, and the next administration might do something different. So yes, it is a very long view, but in the end, I think it's the people, and the voice, in, in the Congress, that needs to reflect Constitution in a better way than it has done so far. Well, when the Chair of Security Network launched in November 2008, we had the idea that this would be a three year campaign and we just need to come up with sensible reform ideas, take them to the new administration, and they would say, These are terrific ideas, let's tweak it a little bit, and we go from there and we do all that in three years. That will be up in October of 31st this year, and uh, I don't think we're going to get there. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's going to take longer than uh, any of us had hoped, but I think it's possible, especially if there is a second Obama term, where there will be less pressure for re-election and maybe more time. Um, will have passed since 9-11 and uh, the grip fear has on people's rational thinking will loosen up a little bit. Uh, that maybe we'll be able to start with some carve outs and as those, um, for example, with peace building, with some basic humanitarian aid, if we can get some of those things to be uh, permissible and show that it's workable, uh, that it doesn't support terrorism, it actually uh, competes with the terrorist narrative, uh, that that then, then we'll get some momentum and maybe get some longer term change. But I think we're looking at um, probably at least another three to five years before we really see anything significant. Maybe that's optimistic. And there's another element that will put pressure on this development and might accelerate it, I don't know, which is the fact that the Muslim world itself is democratizing and it's rising to assert itself. and, and what we might think of as very American ways, but they're very uh, much uh, rooted in their own traditions. And, and these countries have essential relationships with the U.S. and the U.S. is going to feel the pressure because in the past the U.S. has supported some of the dictators while it was talking democracy. Now there are democracies, hopefully, that are going to evolve and they're going to look for a, a healthy relationship with the U.S. And part of what they're going to look at is how the U.S. is treating its Muslims internally. So I'm hoping that this will also help the uh, uh, American government uh, in all its branches to reevaluate the treatment of Muslims at home. Okay, so I'd like to open this up uh, for questions from the audience. If you could, especially since we're filming, identify yourself before you ask your question and please do actually ask a question. <laughs> Hi, my name is Charlie Martel. I just uh, joined the Constitution Project where I'll be working with the, the task force on detaining treatment. So, Dr. Olinger, you are one of my new bosses. Uh, and I want to build on an observation that you made that due to the dramatic events in the last few weeks in the Middle East, now that this is a political issue more than a judicial one, create an opportunity to make a compelling political argument forming the law, which is that the material support law as it exists is a wall between everyone in the United States and all those societies as they try to rebuild. So it's, it's anti-democratic, it, it, it prevents us from engaging uh, those societies where they're at a tipping point where we can redefine our relationship, which is a pretty profound opportunity. 
I mean, it seems to me that arguments could be made under the existing law that a lot of very good faith efforts to support these people in these societies would violate that law. So is there an opportunity to, to argue for reform on the basis of what's happening right now? Yeah, and, and the relationship might not be a logical relationship in the formal sense, but I would suspect, for example, in a situation like Egypt, that somehow we're going to have Egypt leaks on torture in Egypt that was, you know, uh, conducted uh, perhaps with knowledge of our government, I don't know, uh, the rendition issue. And I think once these things start coming up, the people of Egypt are going to start thinking, you know, that they have a real voice in the government about their relationship to this country, and this country is going to think, you know, I, I might need to re-examine my policy to be the Muslim world, including uh, the Muslims in the U.S. I, I already see commentaries in Arabic papers, etc., to that effect, and in, also in the English ones. Uh, it will take a little bit, uh, because we don't know how things are going to gel out in North Africa or the rest of the Muslim world, but I think, yes, something will happen. Um, no, I think. I mean, I think. It, I think if 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 good examples can be found of groups that are on the list and that are sort of in, in the mix in the resettling uh, of a particular country's political framework, uh, then that would be, a, I think, a powerful argument. And, and, you know, the, the the groups that the peace groups and the hand counterterrorism experts generally agree that you know what you do. The way you end resort to violence is by working with moderate forces. With these are these groups are not univalent. You know they have they have different. Um, they have some more extreme elements. They have some more modern elements. If the modern elements can be can show that they can gain uh, progress through peaceful means, then that takes away uh, support for the extremists. I don't know whose whose piece of it was Roger Cohen who said 9/11 and 2/11. That the best response to 9/11 was 2/11 because the people of Egypt showed that through peaceful, non-violent work, they could gain more than terrorists have ever gained, and and that and so to the extent that we can uh, sort of play a role in that, and they, they could play a role in that, but these laws are an impediment. I think that would be a very powerful claim. What I don't know is which groups are on the tre the treasury list is the very broad one. I'm not sure which groups are on that list, but I'm sure some of them, some of the relevant groups would be on the list. Other questions out there? I, I was going to wait till my question to wait the other one, but uh, again, Mace is the director of programs. Um, as this question is kind of the whole panel, you mentioned, Kay, about delisting uh, designated uh, organizations, the, the, the current efforts towards that. When an organization gets a letter, a notification in the mail saying, you know, by the Treasury, okay, you're going to, there's an investigation being opened on you. And I believe that organizations get a 30 day uh, opportunity to respond, I think. They don't really have access to administrative classified information. They may not even be able to access unclassified information. So I know that they, I think they might have, I would like clarification on what access do they have towards their ability to, I guess, challenge the investigation in a transparent way and, you know, without going through all the loopholes of going through all the different levels of review that's within the Department of State or within the Secretary itself and, and not going all the way to, you know, Ultimately, then have to the last effort is the court, which I think is the I think the, the DC US system court here. Well, the process is very summary. Um, if you're a foreign court group or a foreign individual, which most of them are, without any presence in the United States, you have no constitutional rights. The court has said, and so the only right you have is to file a lawsuit. You have no right to any kind of notice. You have no right to. Uh, present your side of the case. You can file a lawsuit, but the government gets to defend its actions based on its administrative record, which it created without you having any input. You're not allowed to put in new evidence, and they can rely on secret evidence. So it's a charade, and it, no one has succeeded. If you're in the U.S., 
if you're a group in the U.S., so the, I represent the Kind Hearts and a group called Al Haramain in, in, in Oregon, which that group was designated, Kind Hearts is just under investigation. If you're in the U.S., the courts have said you have due process rights, and what we're fighting about now is what due process rights require. And originally, the D.C. Circuit said all due process requires is that they give you their non-classified evidence, but they don't have to give you their classified evidence. They don't have to give you security clearances so you can look at the classified evidence. They don't have to tell you the charges in the case. They don't even have to write a statement of reasons explaining why you were designated at the end of the process. So very minimal. Um, the, but that was sort of in the early, early days. And again, this is a long struggle. And we've now had two cases, both Al Harmain and Kind Hearts, in which federal courts have said, that's not due process. Uh, you got to tell people what the charges are. Now, you, you can't have a you know a, a criminal case without an indictment. You can't have a civil case without a complaint. You can't have it without telling people what the charges are. Then you have to and you have to tell them with specific with sufficient specificity so that they can have, pr present a meaningful uh, response. And you have to give them explain why you took the action you took, and then there's judicial review of that. That's what we're sort of struggling for at this point, and there's a, you know, still a big question as to the extent to which they can rely on classified evidence. Um, but it's a very, in the very summary process, I'll just you know, give you an example. In the Kind Hearts case, they get a letter saying you're under investigation. There's no statutory threshold requirement of suspicion or anything for the OFAC to issue that letter. It can issue that letter to any of us tomorrow without any requirement they go to court without any requirement they find probable cause, anything. Once they issue that letter, all of your assets are frozen. So the, the, the next thing they do is they say, well, here's the unclassified evidence that we relied on in opening this investigation. And they send us about 150 pages of documents. Of those 150 pages of documents, 90% don't even mention anybody in Kind Hearts or Kind Hearts. They're about other organizations, other individuals, without any explanation for why any of this, rel any of this is relevant. Ten pages, ten percent of them, fifteen pages, actually mention Kind Hearts, but don't show any wrongdoing that Kind Hearts is alleged to have engaged in. And then we're supposed to defend ourselves on the basis of just to guess what the charges are, intuit what the relationships might be, and pre pre present a defense, all within the 30 days. Uh, that they give you. Um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complete sham. And, and, and two judges now have said it's a, such a complete sham that it violates due process. And we're you know, trying to sort of work out what, the, what actual due process would consist of. Right. That on the reform side, the Charity and Security Network members have developed model due process uh, procedures and standards that, um, that are on our website. and. Representative Allison at the end of the last congressional session introduced a bill that incorporates a lot of those concepts and would create a much better due process uh, situation for, for U.S. charities. It, it, one of the, it, it uses the um, Classified Information Procedures Act uh, procedures so that uh, the charity could either see a summary of the classified record or have an attorney with a security clearance look at the classified record uh, that they would be able to have notice explain the reasons and present uh, evidence uh, to rebut it. Um, but one of the other things that the charities really wanted uh, is a compliance process, a chance to correct any problems. Um, because char charities don't want to support terrorism. If there's a problem, we want to know about it, and we want to fix it. The answer shouldn't be shut down the organization, freeze the funds, so that the people in need at the end of that chain of charity do without. That's not a humane solution. So we uh, built into our proposal, and Representative Ellison's bill had a compliance process that would require uh, the government to sit down with the charity and go through the reasons and then talk about ways that you could correct it. And there uh, could be a variety of things that could be done. Maybe there's a rogue employee that you fire. Maybe you've got a local partner that is controlled by a designated organization and you didn't realize it and you just cut off that partnership and work with another organization. There could be 
a variety of things along those lines. So that's um, what what we think due process should look like, and we expect uh, that Representative Ellison will reintroduce a similar bill in in this session. My name is Barry Webb. I'm from the uh, Department of Justice, and I work in our civilian response corps, which I'm about. I suppose the pointing idea is coming up uh, we are fully active throughout the world. But I, it occurs to me that if the uh, proposed reforms are rational and logical, there has to be some reason that they haven't occurred. Okay. I don't want to get into the fine footage of the law with the professor, but I would say to Judge McCasey, President Carter, uh, will address New York Times separately, are officers of the United States and are traveling under state department duties to go do those things. Well, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and we New York Times, I think they pride we're themselves. I think they pride the themselves on the fact they've never given money to anybody for anything that goes in that paper. Uh, so, uh, or any editorial advice, anything that's been published in there, because it has to be the words we've ever sent in. But let's say for a minute that that's not true, and that. Uh, is it because if the reform that been enacted? Is it because in America we have this fundamental concept that we don't want our citizens running about the world engaging in foreign policy within it? That we want it all centralized and we want it done a, a way? And that's why the Red Cross is chartered by Congress to specifically take that money and do those things? And wouldn't it be better to seek reform in the context of a Red Crescent that is congressionally authorized? and overseen by a congressional committee to carry out the charitable work. That may be foreign to the other concepts you have in mind. But is that not one way to do it? Well, you know, I, I think if you talk to um, uh, peace uh, workers, what you will often find is that the, the United States relies heavily on track two diplomacy, which is situations in which they cannot for the reasons of political uh, posturing cannot engage with the organization, <clears throat> but recognize that the only way to peace is that there be engagement with it. And so, so what they do is they essentially rely on private organizations, the Carter Center, which is not acting as the representative of the United States, but as a private entity, not speaking for the United States, and precisely because he's not speaking for the United States, that he's able to talk to these groups, right? But he can't. But in fact, he can't because it's a crime for him to do it. Why have there not, you know, why is, have there not been reforms given how sensible my positions all are? Uh, you know, I, you're probably better situated to answer that question, being that it was dark part of justice than I am. But you know, I, I, I'll say one thing. Um, right after 9/11, I had into my class on national security and civil liberties. I invited in the guy from Treasury, uh, General Counsel's office, who wrote the. Uh, Executive Order 13224, which is the Treasury Department's material support law. And he came in and he was very proud. You know, we wrote that thing to be as broad as it possibly could. And that, that law allows you to be designated, not only if you have a transaction with a designated entity, but if you are, quote unquote, otherwise associated with a, uh, a designated entity, a term that we challenged and, and the court struck down as unconstitutional. But he was very proud, particularly of that, of that law. Why? Because it was broad. Why did he want it to be broad? Because we want maximum power to negotiate. And trust us, we'll use it in legitimate ways. But if you give us only you know, very constrained power, uh, we won't have as much power to negotiate. So the, the, the argument was, we want to write it as broadly as we can. Trust us, we won't abuse it. Uh, you know, that's often the, the argument of government. They don't like to give up. In the case to me, the treasury is not always as technically capable as they like to think they are in carrying out some of their regulatory authority. Yeah, well, that's true of many governments. <laughs> 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 so I'd have to agree with that. <laughs> Let me comment on the idea of the you know, why not let the Red Cross do it? And there are countries which actually have structured their uh, charitable giving that way, so that there is an official body, and the citizens give to it, and so they can earmark, they can say, this is where I want my money to go, and of course, if there is a problem, it won't. If there isn't a problem, that's exactly what they resist. In this country, we don't have that approach. We have a lot of religious charities 
that are giving a lot of money abroad. The only people look at are the Muslims, and that's the problem. But I um, guess my question was, would it not be easier to get a single organization chartered by Congress than it would be to try to correct all these difficulties in the regulatory scheme? Or is that just, you know, unacceptable for some reason that escapes me? Well, I don't think, I mean, I think it is a little bit the thousand flowers bloom approach, that the, the, free, the, the notion of free speech, free association, etc., is not that we have the right to associate with one officially sanctioned government organization that will, you know, do what it wants to do and only that, but that we have the right to associate with any organization as long as we are not furthering uh, illegal or criminal activity. That's that's the principle. The behavior is extraterritorial, though. You agree with me, the article general restrictions on that behavior. Well, I, I, not, not if it's not if it's speech. I don't think there's any. I, I think it's, you know, I, I, we don't need to belabor this. But I mean, the Supreme Court, in this, in, again, in the Communist Party era, rejected the notion that simply because you were getting, you were having communications with entities outside the United States, namely the Communist Party, the government could stop those communications at the border. It said, no, you have the First Amendment right to, to get that in information, to get that information without interference by the government, without even having to register with the government, even though it's extraterritorial communication. So, no, and, and in the globalized world, the notion that the First Amendment would only protect domestic expression, when, you know, every time you go on the web, you know, half the things you look at on the web are from other countries, and it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, the, you know, know, notions of territorial legitimacy or venue, if you will, have their problems, but... I give you only the comments by everyone regarding the, the situation in Libya. Uh, all the United Nations, all the uh, private sector, uh, all the uh, NGOs talk about uh, human rights law and uh, international law. And President Obama and Ms. Clinton's statements all talk about norms. I challenge you to find the word law in there once. Uh, so I, I'm just saying that the, the view is not one that's unique to a given political cause or party. It's a kind of American way of viewing the world. And it, whether it's right or wrong, it is not necessarily given to one political bent or another. I think the only thing that, well, there are many things that bothers me about this. But the one thing I want to point out, we're not, the, I, at least from my point of view, we're not the kind of country where we want to consolidate too much power in the federal I would, I would agree, but uh, I think what's difficult is that we do give them one thing, and that's foreign policy. And I think the people in, in Dubuque uh, and, I, and Iowa don't really care about foreign policy in the United States, except that they have some confidence that it's unified. And then they give and, it and, and I realize that's untrue. But uh, again, that was the exact, that, those arguments were made with respect to the Communist Party. It's an international conspiracy run by a country with massive amounts of nuclear weapons, engaged in an effort to overthrow the United States by force of violence. It's foreign policy. Americans shouldn't have anything to do with it. And the Supreme Court said, no, that's wrong. America, you know, that may be the American foreign policy, but the First Amendment says that each, it's not about the American way. It's each about each, protecting each of us in having, uh, in having the freedom to choose our way, whether it's the American way or not, as long as we're not furthering violence for the entire time. Yeah, just let me say one. Yeah, uh, actually, I'd like to give other people an opportunity to ask, ask questions, please. Okay, the gentleman in the front. Yeah. Amanda Dean Atman, the Minaret of Freedom Institute. And my question, I guess, is really for Kay, but I welcome comments by anybody. Regarding the kinds of changes and reforms that you want to see made, it seems to me that what changes may have been made politically or exec to executive fiat in the communist era, or the, regarding the McCarthy era, uh, were made in a presence where there was not only concern about what was going on, but contempt for it. And my concern is that I don't see the Muslim community showing its contempt for these laws. Uh, I see these contempt on um, John Stewart's Daily Show. But as far as I know, I, at my organization, the Merit of Freedom Institute, is the only one that will publish an article on nonviolence addressed to all Muslims and say when we ask all Muslims to engage in nonviolent activity, we include Hamas and Hezbollah in that recommendation. Well, what the, our reform effort is mainly U.S. organizations. And Where is we, it? But it's, it's broad based and it's not just Muslim charities, it, it's uh, all kinds of faith based groups, uh, human rights groups, uh, grant makers, civil liberties groups. It, it affects 
civil society broadly. So it's an issue not that affects this, in some ways the strength of our democratic form of government because if civil society is weakened to the point where you can't speak out or you're afraid to operate in this way, then um, it, it, it interferes with the balance between government and people. It, it just, um, without getting into a long restatement of the First Amendment argument. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but we, we're not approaching it as, as a as an issue that um, that just Muslim organizations need to speak out. That being said, the the entire U.S. charitable sector has um, not spoken out against these laws in, at the level that it has needed to. And I think I think in the first several years after 9/11 and charities were being shut down and funds frozen, we thought that the courts would take care of it because it was so outrageous and it seemed so unconstitutional and that that would solve the problem and we wouldn't have to get out and risk getting shut down ourselves or alienating our donors. Um, the courts didn't take care of it and so that's why these legislative uh, and regulatory advocacy projects have evolved. To, I think to you missed the point of my question. I'm not saying I don't think it's sufficient to speak out against it. I think organizations have to engage in benign legal, other than in violation of this law, legal activities that can be deemed to be in violation of law in the same way that uh, Professor Cole and Professor al had said that very benign and what we think are really legal activities because they're because this law because this law is unconstitutional uh, what, what could be interpreted as violating that law and that only I'm saying that only if that kind of mass activity takes place will you get the climate in which the political reform will take place because I think that's what happened before. I mean, it, by the time that those terrible laws were repealed, they were really much in disrespect in the same way that at the time slavery was repealed, you know. So you're talking about civil disobedience. Yes, yeah. And, 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 and say that, you know, sometimes, sometimes the court is slow to act. We may, in retrospect, say, yeah, that was unconstitutional, when at the time the court said it was constitutional. I'm thinking of the Red Scott decision. The court said that, you know, that was constitutional. It could be that uh, the evolving don't ask, don't tell enforcement situation is taking us down that road and organizations are doing what they need to do to save lives and help people in desperate need. They're just not advertising it because A, they don't want to go to jail and B, they have to protect their organization's ability to keep doing that crucial work. But the problem with that is that when the Muslim organization falls, they're quiet. I mean, it is not like their activity is a civil disobedience movement that's going to protect the Muslims or the American society. So long as it is quiet, whoever falls, falls on their own, and it is their own fault. To engage in civil uh, disobedience activity, you need more than organizations. You really need a mass movement. And that mass movement cannot but be led by the Muslim community. You can't expect somebody else to fight our fights. Well, you'll be surprised to know that in talking even today uh, to local leaders, Muslim leaders, in various parts of the country, they still do not know the extent of the problem. Mm -hmm. They're afraid, but they don't know the extent of the problem. And they think that there are ways maybe, that, until they understand, you see, these are legal discussions. Uh, not everybody either um, uh, is interested or will focus on that. We need to have this translated into something that the average person on the street will understand before we can create a mass movement that will get into civil disobedience. That's my thing. I think we have uh, time for uh, two last questions. Melanie and then... I'm Melanie Greenberg. I've been a longtime member of the Peace Building community and until recently ran a foundation that gave money away for peace building activities around the world. And so I'm very engaged in these issues. Um, and I really agree with Dr. Lahibri that we need to move beyond the legal framework and lobbying and changing laws, all that's necessary. Think about a mass movement. But I think I disagree with you that it only has to be for the Muslim community to take it all on their shoulders, that there could be supporters. And I'm thinking about some recent work, for example, on preventing genocide, that some very effective groups like Enough and the Genocide Prevention Network have gone to college campuses around the country on these issues. 
They've enlisted people like Angelita Jolie, you know, who can go out and say, I believe in this. And perhaps what we need on these issues um, is to try to engage some groups we might not normally deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and try to do something a little bit larger. But I think it has to be all of our responsibilities, not just the Muslim yeah, I don't disagree with you, but I think the Muslims should be right there. And we need to work on educating them about these issues in a much more practical way. And, and maybe Karama could lead a constitutional education program around the country in ways that are a lot more accessible. But I don't think the Muslims should be doing this alone. As I said, it's not a Muslim problem. It's an American problem. Right. It's what we want yeah. our country to look like. Yeah. And Kay, do you want to give a plug? I literally just before walking over here got an email from Kay about her effort to. <laughs> you want to? Yeah. Uh, since we weren't able to, we don't think we're going to get all the changes made in, in two and a half, three years. What we're doing this year is launching uh, an outreach campaign, much more broadly to the nonprofit sector. We have a, a statement of basic principles that I just sent out today to our membership list and then we'll be doing outreach to other organizations to get them to sign on, uh, really trying to target organiz mainstream organizations, large groups that represent a broad uh, segment of American society to publicly show that there are support for these principles and that we want the law to reflect that. So that it's going to be uh, much more campaign uh, over the course of this year, outreach and building that kind of public support um, rather than spending lots of hours in the halls of Congress, who, that will come next. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we have one final question now here. Beverly Britain Lifeline Network for Peace. Um, I've been working for over 20 years in interfaith dialogue uh, globally, uh, working with uh, PTSD, particularly with survivors of rape and torture. Uh, worked a lot in um, humanitarian aid delivery. Um, I was in Bosnia, my first trip to Bosnia in 94, absolutely underlined to me that it was really about setting up Islam as the next ideology to hate. And people who heard me say that then and thought I was crazy have been calling me all <laughs> for the last five years and I'm going to be talking about this and it's really happening now. Um, in the interfaith dialogue arena and peace building and so forth, as we, we, we're on six continents and um, it, in a coalition. And um, it, is, it is at the point where I think now, uh, still, Muslims are so afraid in this country. It is like being great survivors. And um, if I'm quiet, nobody will hurt me. And that is something that has to be addressed, and I get um, a little insane.